what is the scariest game you've ever played? You're probably thinking of classic horror games like Amnesia. Maybe Layers of Fear. Or Minecraft Survival on Hard Mode. And although those games are indeed some of the scariest games in existence, there is one game that has captivated thousands, even though it does not exist. I'm talking about a game called Petscope, a game that was supposedly released in 1997 for the PlayStation 1, but any search of the game will inevitably lead back to one and the same source, a YouTube channel created in March 2017, simply named Petscope. On this channel, videos are uploaded where the game is presented to us in a let's play format, narrated by our protagonist, Paul. The series starts off as a way for Paul to show off the game he found to his unnamed friend. The game seems to be a cheerful kids game, but as will quickly become apparent, this is nothing more than a fake front for a dark and twisted tale. What the fuck? Paul quickly becomes obsessed with trying to unravel the weird game mechanics in order to progress the increasingly mysterious and dark storyline. What makes the Petscop series an even more densely packed enigma is that Paul's narration, actions and even the video description and channel about section serve as a meta-narrative, intentionally blurring the line where we, the viewers, would normally distinguish reality from fiction in a regular Let's Play. This is the website. For some reason it's in the game on a computer screen. Now before we start the in-depth analysis of the Pet Club videos, I want to give a fair warning that this series references some very disturbing events that happened in real life, so some viewer discretion is advised. If you're one of my three subscribers that came here expecting more of this, this, or this, feel free to click away now. But with that being said, let's begin the analysis of the first video. The first video of Petscope was uploaded on the 12th of March 2017. It starts out with the standard PS1 boot screen, but it has a slight audio glitch at the end. In the beginning I didn't think much about it, and if it wasn't pointed out to me, I might have even missed it or written it off as a buffering glitch. But as the series progressed, I started to believe that no detail is accidental, and this is just a subtle way of conveying the dark turn this series will ultimately take. The video continues with an eerie hum that goes on for just long enough to make me feel uneasy. Which transitions into the logo of Garolina, the company that supposedly made the game. However, just like the game Petscope, Garolina is an entirely fictitious company that solely exists within the Petscope universe. We are then introduced to our narrator, Paul, who seems to be talking to a specific person directly. I'm just gonna walk you through everything that I've seen so far. The manner in which he speaks throughout the series hints towards this person being his friend. This was confirmed several months after the first Petscop video by the channel's about page. He states that he has already played through part of the game and will go through it again to demonstrate the progress he has been able to make. The purpose of this video is, in his words, to prove to you that I'm not lying about this game that I found. Now if we take a moment to look at the image quality of the video, we can see that this is interlaced footage, or at least trying to emulate it, which would make sense if it were a PS1 game. If you're unaware, interlacing is a method used for video transmission to all television sets to increase the perceived frame rate. I'll leave a link to a video in the description that does an excellent job at explaining the details, but all you need to know for now is that modern computer screens use a different display technique where it causes lines to appear in certain videos. If we offset the video by one frame, and look at the difference between the frames, we can clearly see that there is more motion going on in the triangle than simple interlacing artifacts. Add this to the triangle being for the go back option, and it provides another subtle detail to this game not being what it seems on the surface. Paul starts a new save file, and after a short loading screen we enter the main game. We start in an area called the Gift Plane. The sign near the start of the game states that the Gift Plane has closed, and that it used to be a home for over a hundred pets. The sign continues by stating that they, quote, have failed to remove all of the pets from their homes. This phrasing seems a bit strange, almost indifferent towards the fate of the pets. It doesn't say relocated to a new home or something similar, instead they say removed from their homes, 
were the pets forcibly removed from their homes? Or was the sign just written by PETA? The sign continues by stating that 48 pets remain here at the time of writing, and encourages Paul to find some pets to take with him in the 8 homes of the gift plane. The first thing my mind went to after reading this was that this series would be some kind of knockoff Pokemon creepypasta. But believe me, that is definitely not the case. The numbers 48 and 8 on the sign are depicted with a red gradient, and jitter in a manner similar to the triangle button on the home screen. And in fact, the jittering of the straight vertical line on the number 4 first convinced me that this was no random artifact, but an intentional movement to build tension in the game. The sign then finishes by stating that we should have no problem finding somebody that we love. The phrasing somebody is used in the context of pets, which is an odd way of referring to animals. They don't use the phrasing, you should have no problem finding one that you love, which would make more sense in this situation. As we will see later in the video, and also in future Petscope videos, this is definitely an intentional phrasing and ties in with the dark themes of Petscope. Paul walks down the road, to the right side of the gift plane, and notes that the game is apparently unfinished, as there is nothing here, not even something to prevent us to go there. He then enters Evencare, which is according to him, the one and only level. The appearance of Evencare reminds me of a kindergarten, with some chairs and desks, some simple markings on the floors and walls, and bright colors. Specifically pink and blue are used, colors usually associated with boys and girls, especially when they are children. In fact, the vibrant colors provide a stark contrast between the environment and Paul's avatar. Paul's avatar is a drab shade of green. He has no pupils, and his face is expressionless in general. This is an unconventional choice for what is seemingly a kid's game, as it breaks all the rules of how to appeal to young children. The avatar also doesn't have any arms or hands, something that is jokingly or perhaps mockingly referred to when Paul first tries to open the door in the back of the first room. The first room has a painting of two figures, revealed to be the pets Toneth the bird and Randus the flower. Their names are displayed in red and green, a visual cue that will be used throughout the series to identify different characters. Scattered throughout the world of Petscope are collectibles, similar to coins from the Super Mario games. One stylistic detail that I want to mention that makes you feel a bit more uncomfortable is the sound they make when collecting them. The sound seems to be reversed, and when playing the audio in reverse, the sound seems more like something you would hear when collecting items like these in other games. The second room has two signs. The first sign reads, when choosing a pet, choose somebody that you like. You don't have to love them right away. Similar to the sign outside of the gift plane, pets are referred to as somebody, reinforcing the uncomfortable atmosphere the game conveys. The sign next to it reads, don't be discouraged if they run from you. They really do want a home. They're afraid. Show them that there's nothing to be afraid of. This sentence raises some red flags by itself, but remember that the sign outside said, we have failed to remove all the pets from their homes? These messages seem to contradict each other. Maybe the pets are afraid because they don't want to be removed from their homes, and the staff that removed them was doing so forcibly and against their will. Paul continues to the next room, where they find the first pet, Amber. Amber appears to be in a cage of some sort, there is a trophy on the middle table that reads Awarded to our Amber for being a real champ yesterday and today. She hasn't left her cage once. Paul then shows how he was able to catch Amber, as he has already been through this part off camera. He first opens the left cage, after which Amber is quick to jump to the cage on the right side. Paul then approaches Amber on the right side, but she jumps away again, as if she's trying to run from Paul, like the sign stated. The only way Paul is able to catch Amber is to lock himself in her cage causing her to jump back. After which he uses an unseen pathway to exit through the other side. Now previously, all signs referred to the homes of pets. But Amber was found in a cage. Does Amber see the cage as her home? Did she jump back into the cage after Paul locked himself in, thinking it was empty? Amber's description reads, Amber is a young ball. She is afraid to leave home. If her home is good, this is not a problem. She is very heavy, and it makes her life a little harder, as well as yours. What's the safest place you can put her in? You should start thinking about that. Let's also take a look at Amber's appearance. At first she seems goofy, with a green hat and a smirk with her tongue stuck out. But if you look at it in another way, the tongue kind of looks like a teardrop, which would make her expression turn from goofy 
to incredibly sad. If this is intentional, and I think it is, as I said I don't think that any detail is accidental, I have to give incredible props to the artist who designed her for being able to include this subtle ambiguity in such a minimalistic way. Paul comes across another pet, later revealed to be Roneth, but he is unable to catch this one. He continues to another room, where he has to set the number of a treadmill to 7 in order for his copy to end up on the same piano key as the pet. The next room has two pets, Wavy the Cloud and Randis the Flower. The two seem to be in a symbiotic relationship. In order to catch them, Paul needs to split them up by putting a bucket where Randis would normally pop up. This results in Wavy raining into the bucket, which in turn causes Randis to shrivel up and Paul is able to catch both of them. Paul returns to Ronit's room, and he tells about a note he found with the game. In the original video, the note was superimposed as an annotation, as well as being read out by Paul. But since YouTube got rid of all annotations earlier this year, it is unfortunately no longer visible on the video. The note reads, I walked downstairs, and when I got to the bottom, instead of proceeding, I turned the right and became a shadow monster man. 13th of June, 1997, please go to my website on the sticker and also go to Ronit's room and press start and press down, 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 right, start. Now the first part of this note has more significance later on, so for now I'll leave it for what it is. Paul enters the code from the note and the music stops. Right, start. All right. So you can see that it accepted it and the music stopped. I'm just gonna go out this way here. It'll be a little bit different. After exiting Evencare, he ends up in a dark and empty field instead of the gift plane. All right. This gloomy environment seems to be a more fitting match for the appearance of Paul's avatar. While leaving, there's also something going on with the loading screens. Initially, when going from one room to another inside of Evencare, the screen turns white as a transition. But after Paul enters the code, the screens turn black and last a lot longer. Within Evencare, this seems like a stylistic choice. But remember when the game first started, and when we entered Evencare? The loading screen was more elaborate. And when we crank up the brightness on the screen where Paul leaves Evencare, we can see the following. Now I'm not sure if this incompleteness of the picture is a result of the video compression or it was intentional, but we can still make out something that looks like a crude drawing of a face. We will encounter this face again in a later video. On a personal note, I only found out about this image through other Petscope analysis videos, and I didn't notice it at all when viewing the first video myself. And knowing now that this face was staring back at me while being completely unaware of its presence does a much better job at selling the tension and uncomfortable atmosphere than the reflexive reaction to a cheap jump scare would do. On the dark field outside, Paul tells us that he hasn't been able to find anything here, but he's convinced that there is something here. He cuts off mid-sentence and excitedly states that he has finally found something. He found some sort of hatch, similar to the hatches leading to basements in some houses. Paul then tells us that he has been unable to open the door and he asks whether his friend has noticed some detail that could provide a clue in opening the door. He is unwilling to turn off the console because he is afraid he won't be able to find the hatch again. And with that, the first video concludes. One thing that I noticed about this sentence is that it seems like Paul is unable to save his game. Why else would he be hesitant in turning off the console? At the same time, in later videos it would seem that he has either found a way to save his game or there is some autosave feature. In later episodes, the save files will play a more prominent role, so for now I will leave that as a note to keep in mind. The first video of Petscop does an excellent job in creating an uncomfortable atmosphere and setting the tone for how the rest of the series will progress. Much like series such as Don't Hug Me I'm Scared, Petscop tricks you into thinking that it will be all family friendly fun, only to take a disturbing, morbid turn. With this first episode, we've been given a glimpse into this dark future, but for now we just have to wait on the field until Paul finds a way to open the door. <laughs>